It's hard to believe, but it was almost exactly 50 years ago that Atlantic Records released Crosby, Stills and Nash, the debut album from the folk rock supergroup of the same name. Crosby, Stills and Nash brought together three accomplished musicians from some of the 60s most popular bands, David Crosby of The Birds, Stephen Stills of Buffalo Springfield and Graham Nash of The Hollies. The trio soon became a quartet when Neil Young joined the group a few months later, just in time to perform at Woodstock. When another classic album, Deja Vu, followed a year later, it appeared as if Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young were poised to conquer the world. But that's not exactly what happened. Instead, what came next was a decades-long soap opera involving drugs, egos, infighting, jealousies, reunions, and enough stories to fill a book. Luckily, someone has written that book, and it's called Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, The Wild Definitive Saga of Rock's Greatest Supergroup. Its author is Rolling Stone senior writer David Brown, who joins us now as part of 13's celebration of the summer of 69. David, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to be here. So David, you know, reading the book, I remember riding in my car, my father was driving, and the summer of 69, downtown Jacksonville, Florida, suddenly the DJ comes up and introduces Marrakesh Express by the new supergroup, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Now, I knew Crosby because I'd seen him and Johnny Carson performing with the Birds, and I'd heard the Hollies, and I'd heard Buffalo Springfield. But I didn't know Stills, and I didn't know Nash. So the question is, um, was I alone, or was this really <laughs> a supergroup before their debut album? Well, the definition of a supergroup at the time, it's, it's kind of a, a lost art form in rock, but was that you had members of uh, other bands coming together to form a new group. And uh, so Stills and Nash were not household names at the time, but their bands had had hits. You know, Buffalo Springfield had For What It's Worth, and the Hollies had mm -hmm. a slew of hits over here. So uh, the, the whole idea of the group was, it was kind of a grand experiment in rock. We're gonna take people who'd been in other bands from a new group, which no one was doing at the time. Usually you stuck with your band. Right, right. This, so there, the whole idea of CSN and why from the start was, you know, we're gonna break the rules in every way. We're going to do things the way we want them. We'll make records in whatever combinations we want. We'll use our names. That yeah. was very unique at the yeah. time. Usually people had group names. Yeah, I want to ask Other about than Simon that. and Garfunkel, there was hard to find a, right. a, a, a That's people true. Simon and Garfunkel. Names. That's right. But uh, th their whole thing was we're going to, very much in keeping with the the 60s ethos, we're going to, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to go by the rules. We're going to break mm -hmm. the rules and, and do things our way and kind of, you know, in the freedom of the time. So the album comes out. I mean, and it's a huge hit. What is it about that album that people found so irresistible? Well, first of all, you have to start with the music. The songs, which we all know to this day, have endured, whether it's Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, yeah. Wooden Ships, Marrakesh Express, uh, Helplessly Hoping. I mean, people are, are covering these songs. Brandy Carlisle just recently covered one of these songs. You know, so the, the songwriting was really strong. And the sound of the group, those harmonies that they, uh, there have been harmony groups before. The Beach Boys, right. the Four Seasons, et cetera. But, but their harmonies were unique. The th three very different voices that somehow came together and created a sound that no one had kind of heard before. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it was the context of the times. You're talking about the uh, spring, summer of 69. The country had been through the assassinations of, of uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Bobby Kennedy, Kennedy, the Democratic Convention of 68, yeah. Nixon, Vietnam. And here was a record that just exuded a, a certain beauty and joy right. a, a, in those harmonies and, and a sort of optimistic feel. Right. To some that degree, really they reflected the times. To some degree, they were a relief of the times. They were kind of a relief. And even when they sang about the times on that album, like Long Time Gone, which sure. was written and recorded initially by Crosby just a few days after Bobby Kennedy's death, um, even a song like that, it, didn't, it was an escapist, but it also said, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're addressing times, but we can sort of, we can handle it, we can kind of, Deal with it and get beyond it. Mm -hmm. So, as you said, you know th these guys never really gave this band a name, right? As you say, it's more like a sounds more like a law firm than exactly. it does a rock exactly. group. Uh, so, and, and they did it just to have a certain degree of freedom to feel like they had a certain degree of freedom. It was a statement, yeah. basically, to say, look, we um, we're a group now. We might not always be a group. We might want to make records on our own. You're talking about guys who had pretty strong egos yeah. to going into it. Yeah, we'll talk about uh, it. All. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about a group that before they hired Neil, they were in search of other backup musicians. Yeah. And they approached people like Steve Winwood and George Harrison. So, you know, as you said, these voices were perfect harmony. Uh, it was like the perfect balance, right? Exactly. All the critics said so at the time. 
So the the album comes out, and what do they do right after the album comes out? They mess with that with, with that balance <laughs> and bring in Neil Young. Why? It was kind of a mutually uh, uh, agreed upon decision in some way, mutually beneficial one, I should say, in that. CSN didn't have a full band back. They needed some extra musicians behind them, and hence them approaching people like Steve Winwood, who turned them down. And uh, Neil, even though he's a, an iconic rock figure now, it's, uh, we have to remember that back then, his, his own career after being in Buffalo Springfield had gotten off to a rocky commercial start. Yeah. Great music, album like everybody knows, This Is Nowhere, Cinnamon Girl, Down By The River, not a big hit album at all. And so, you know, his profile was, uh, he was struggling in terms of that aspect. And uh, he knew going into it that joining up with this established, newly established supergroup and having his name added on the end would help him a lot in terms of his public profile. They needed another backup musician. Uh, their record company kind of egged them into it, like, come on, Neil, join, that'll be a good thing. So they all just said, okay, let's try it out and uh, let's hold our breath and see how it's gonna go. Now, so the, the subtitle of the book is The Wild Definitive Saga of Rock's Greatest Supergroup. A supergroup of right. uh, specifically defined. But I wonder, how would you, where would you put them in the pantheon of bands, mm. of, of rock bands? Well, I, you know, I think they're kind of, they're up there, for sure. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book. I felt that, that in some ways, they're um, underappreciated. It's kind of a strange term to use for them, given their legendary status. But when you do think of the great bands, you know, um, uh, Beatles, Stones, you know, Grateful yeah. Dead, whatever. Yeah. CSN don't always come to mind automatically. And I think it's because they've had such a fractured history. Yeah. They're, they're on again, they're off again. People think, are they a group? Is Neil part of it? But, you know, when you, when you look at the body of work over 50 years, the, not just the early records together, they made some terrific music on their own in the 70s and into the 80s. Uh, Neil Young continues to be super prolific and, and has, has written a lot of great songs himself. David Crosby has made some own albums uh, recently that are good. When you look at the whole body of work and how so much of it has stood the test of time, you go, yeah, you know, they should be considered yeah. up there in that okay. pantheon. And as I said, people are still recording and covering those songs. Uh, people are still playing Ohio. I've, yeah. I've heard two or three groups in the last year do cover versions of Ohio. Yeah. Well, David, the book is Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, The Wild Definitive Saga of Rock's Greatest Supergroup. It's a fantastic read. Thank it's you. a really good book. Thank you so much was, for joining us to talk about it.